In the middle of Wiltshire lies a ring of large standing stones, each weighing around 25 tons. It is believed the monument was assembled between four or five thousand years ago. Archaeological evidence suggests it may have been a burial site, or perhaps a place of healing where the injured were taken. Some also theorise it may have had a religious or astronomical importance. We call this place Stonehenge. We also call it a monument, but we don't even know if its creators would think such a thing. The culture that produced it left no written records, and even how it was built is still up for debate. In 1136, in his book The History of the Kings of Britain, Geoffrey of Monmouth, an early British historiographer, claimed the wizard Merlin built Stonehenge. Here's an illustration from the mid-14th century based on that theory. For roughly 500 years, building something like Stonehenge seemed so difficult that it was commonly accepted that a wizard did it. Apparently he did it with his best their hands too. Thanks, Jeffrey. It's a mysterious place because it provides us with questions and no real answers. What was the intent of its creators? What did they think of it? And what became of them? What would a Britain built by these people look like? The so-called monument points away to a version of the world that never came to be. Instead, it's one of the sole creations of a culture whose ideas and intent have simply vanished. Will we ever really know who built Stonehenge? Or what it was for? Probably not. And besides, it's just a bunch of rocks. <sighs> anyway, today we're going to talk about Dragon's Lair. March, 1983. The arcade game entitled Mappy has just been released. You play as a police mouse who has to take back stolen goods from a gang of cats by bouncing around in a weird void with random objects in it. You can't really tell those pinky purpley things are cats, and also one would question the ability of a police captain who sent a mouse with no backup to confiscate stolen goods from an army of cats, but it's fine enough. On June 14th, Mario Brothers hit arcades. This was the first appearance of Mario's brother, Luigi. Oh boy, I'm so happy to meet Mario, but with different colours. Together, up to two players can jump around in a hellish void knocking pixelated facsimiles of turtles around. I mean, both of these games are fun to play, but visually speaking, they're pretty poor appropriations of the thing the player's told they're doing. I'm telling you all this so you can maybe imagine the impact when, on June 19th that year, just five days after Mario Brothers told you this mass of colours was a man called Luigi, this happened. Dragon's Lair. You control the actions of a daring adventurer finding his way through the castle of a dark wizard. Hey look, it's an actual person who is trying to not die in an actual dungeon-looking place. And look how much animation there is! Look at the actual capital A animation! And if we look closely enough, we can even, maybe, see a game in here somewhere. The mechanics of the game are very simplistic. You watch the pretty impressively animated character make his way through a room, and then press one of four directions or the attack button when it's appropriate to do one of those things. And if you do the wrong thing, you lose a life and get to watch a death animation. And to store all the data for those animations, the arcade game used a revolutionary content distribution system for the time, called a Laserdisc. Ow! Laserdiscs had been in use since the late 70s, but the idea of using one of these as a way of storing more picture and sound information than a normal arcade game could use hadn't been implemented in many games at this point. This game was designed by Don Bluth, former Disney animator, and Rick Dyer. Forget about this guy, you'll never hear from him again. Let's just talk about Don Bluth some more. He'd just made The Secret of Nim, one of the best-looking animated films ever, and was about to go on to make Rockadoodle, Thumbelina, A Troll in Central Park, The Pebble and the Penguin, Titan AE, and also some good films. I never saw any of the good ones growing up, um, so... Bluth and his small team used their animation chops to create an actually nice-looking game with dynamism and charm. The game looked amazing, and everyone knew it. Even though it was more expensive to play than other games, they had huge lines at arcades, and the machine sold amazingly, with arcade producers partially thanking it for getting them through a financially difficult time in history. And I do mean difficult. 
outside of arcades, what would later be called the Great Video Game Crash of 1983 was happening. The revenues of home game sales dropped almost 97%, but Dragon's Lair and its appealing gimmick had somewhat insulated arcades from these troubles. This article from 1984 says Laserdisc games may be the wave of the future and drums up hype for Bluth's next game, Space Ace. <laughs> Space Ace was similarly great looking, though it was effectively the same game as its predecessor, only with a different theme and new animations. It's just as fun to watch, but by the time of its release later in 1984, however, that wasn't really enough. The lack of gameplay in these games had come back to haunt them in the market. There wasn't much replay value. Once you knew how to beat it, that was it. This put an upper ceiling on how much a person could go back and enjoy something, when other games had many levels and increasing difficulty. Players had grown tired of the style, and arcade owners weren't into buying expensive game units with temperamental discs inside them that players could memorize and never play again. What they want is variety. We constantly get tired of one type of food or one type of movie or one type of game, and so as you progress, you want to go on to a new thing. Laserdisc games had proven to be more the splash of the future than the wave, and the tide had gone out. I think I might have gone a little bit overboard with the water metaphors. So what if you wanted more of this type of game, or wanted to see what directions the genre explored as time went on? There've been a couple of revivals over the years, like Braindead 13, which is probably straight up the best example of this weird subgenre of playable animation. And there's also more weird cash-ins from the original boom to go back and find, like uh, Time Gal, or Ninja Hayate, or Super Don Quixote, or... Ashes I'll run, Miller. If your timing is off, poor Don will die a hideous death. Or Cliffhanger, which was actually made out of recut footage from Lupin the Third films, including Castle of Cagliostro. So we technically got an arcade game featuring animation by Hayao Miyazaki. That's kind of mind blowing. Jam! Jam! It was clearly rushed incredibly quickly to make it to market, so the dub is so atrocious that you can actually make out the original Japanese voices from the films underneath. Ready, sir? Dragon's Lair's namesake earned it a good deal of notoriety and nostalgia, even as its format and imitators failed. The game had several sequels, and has been repackaged many times onto almost every imaginable console. There was an Indiegogo campaign to fund a piece designed to help fund a Dragon's Lair movie. In other words, to take even what game there was out of their game. There's also a couple of different ports that are actually new games, including a famously ridiculously difficult NES version, of which I've never even beaten the first screen. There's a rubbish SNES version of Space Ace, but neither actually captures the thing that made these games cool and unique at the time, so they wouldn't be all that interesting even if they were fun. So if you're interested in tracking this genre of fully animated adventure game, there isn't that much to track. But what if I told you there was an even more true successor to Dragon's Lair than the hasty sequels or the cash-ins? What if I told you there was a secret, forgotten third game in the saga of Dragon's Lair and Space Ace? Ooh, saga. That makes it sound important. But first, a question everyone seems to take for granted. Who made Dragon's Lair? When people think of Dragon's Lair, they think of Don Bluth. It's easy to see why. Let's look at one of the posters. Magicom presents a Don Bluth Studios production. Design and animation, Don Bluth. Produced by Don Bluth. Directed by Don Bluth. Copyright, Don Bluth. Posters don't have to be arranged this way. This is a purposeful choice. It creates the impression that, like a modern day Merlin, Don Bluth assembled Dragon's Lair with his own two hands. Jeffrey of Monmouth never left us. He just became a marketing consultant. The creator is Don Bluth, who once directed several Disney features in the mid-1970s. Last year, Bluth found his own audience with his first animated feature, The Secret of Nim. You see, people tend to remember history in terms of winners. Secret of Nim had been wildly successful the previous year. Don Bluth was swiftly becoming a household name, and his legend about leaving Disney and piling everything he had into Nim, even mortgaging his house to complete it, and making it all back and more, was compelling. History likes people who gamble and win, and history tends to only remember whose name was on the poster. History has a knack of not remembering the hundreds of talented people who worked on Secret of Nim, or the other animators behind Dragon's Lair, or the programmers who made the system work at all, or the man who actually made the game. The idea of turning cartoons into video games was developed at Rick Dyer Industries. 
we're in the entertainment business. Remember Rick Dyer? Despite the game actually being conceived and programmed by RDI Video Systems, and RDI being short for Rick Dyer Industries, history appears to have conspired to make sure people forget Dyer and that the game was his idea, and that he'd had this idea for a long time. It's the forerunner of Dragon's Lair. It was developed way back in 1979. This was Dyer's first computerized interactive game. Dyer had spent his youth making fantasy games, using text and pictures drawn onto cash register paper, programmed to scroll to the right point as he made choices. When attempts to sell a digitized game along these lines failed, he decided that more animation would create a better connection with the viewer, and started work on Dragon's Lair. Later, he hired Don Bluth's studio to do the animation itself. But despite his success, Dyer was aware of the flaws with Dragon's Lair and Space Ace. Firstly, he'd wanted people to be able to play them at home, but arcades had become a necessity given the expense of the technology required to play them. Secondly, they were short and had limited scope in terms of story or genuine decision making. Dyer had gotten into making games as a kid because he liked to make big adventures with grand stories. He wasn't happy with Dragon's Lair or Space Ace. He wanted to make something bigger. I think right now the arcade industry is playing catch-up to us. I know what, uh, what's coming after our, uh, the introduction of our home, home system. system. What I'm going to do is to create a world that is so real and that you will we'll have a hard time telling what's real and what isn't. In late 1984, Dyer's company began work on what he hoped would blow the lid off of home gaming again after its collapse. He was about to announce a new games console. The Halcyon was an incredibly ambitious system. The name, designed to deliberately invoke the name of HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey, and no, that's not me being weird and reading too much into it this time, they really meant to invite that comparison. If you remember the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, there was a computer in that movie called HAL. Why you would make your console invoke the name of an AI that goes mad and kills most of its crew, I don't know. I think he might have fallen asleep halfway through the film. For the time, it was ambitious, the same way Dragon's Lair had been. You could speak to Hal, the name of the AI in the Halcyon, and it could talk back to you and even remember your name. Good evening, Hal. What do you want, Rick? <laughs> what do you want, Rick? <laughs> Sounds so mad at him. Eight. <laughs> Forty-seven spins. Disco. Maybe he's what a computer should have been all along. Something that pe that anybody can use because anybody can talk. Uh, hang on. Clearly, Rick Dyer's never been to Liverpool. Ha ha ha. Obviously, this is basic AI by modern standards, but the idea of a home media device you could talk to in 1984 before the 8 bit Nintendo Entertainment System was even out in America or Europe was kind of amazing. Visit worlds which were only dreams before Halcyon, like nothing you have experienced. Here's Dyer demonstrating how on a 1985 edition of the show Computer Chronicles. If I have your voice print, please say your name. Stuart. Nice to see you again, Stuart Cheshire. Can I call you Stuart? Yes. Yes, okay, Pretty Stuart. Impressive. And to launch with it, Dyer and his team were working on a new game. It was called Taya's Quest. The game that comes with this is Thayer's Quest. This is a story about greed, about unbridled ambition and power lust, and the disaster resulting from those faults. Thayer's Quest was going to be more than just a video file with button prompts. Thayer's Quest was going to be an adventure. What we're creating is going to allow you to be anything that you ever wanted to be and experience it. You're going to, you're going to be there. You will live and die by your decisions. <laughs> A game where you choose where your character goes on a journey across a world of five kingdoms interacting with an all-new fantasy story. Unlike standard video games that demand quick reflexes, the new project places a premium on thinking. You talk to the computer, and it will talk back. 
an adventure featuring animation instead of just text or the day's primitive graphics, utilising Laserdisc technology once more, but on a scale even more grand than the game's spiritual predecessors, and doing it all in the player's own home. We're estimating that you'll be able to play the game 20 hours a week for six months before you will have explored the, the entire world. The price tag of this home Laserdisc player slash games console slash talking AI computer? 2,500 US dollars. That's nearly $6,000 in 2017 money, which means that in the UK it would cost at least £400. Laserdisc players were crazy expensive at the time, but even that was pretty steep. But hey, you could play an animated adventure quest by talking to a computer. And there has never been speech recognition of the high caliber that this has. Well, not really. Let's go to the forest clearing. One. Blood. One. Speak. Consistently, Stuart. One. Sir. Two. Two. Is that okay? I mean, <laughs> sure. You see, this was the 80s. People had an idea of what the future was going to look like without really knowing it or thinking about its practicalities. The future is always different from how people of the present think the future will be. The Halcyon was ultimately a poor facsimile of one man's best guess as to what the future would look like and it turned out not to be a very good guess. Still, I really wanted to know what this device was actually like to use, and what Taya's Quest played like, so I decided to take a look on eBay and see if one popped up. That was a year and a half ago. So far I've seen one go up for $600 plus some hefty import fees. Based on rumblings on other forums, one tends to appear on eBay, perhaps even the same one, every year or so. While flyers advertising the Halcyon were circulated and some stores even took pre-orders and some salesmen were given copies to demonstrate to potential customers, it's actually up for debate whether the Halcyon was ever officially released. It's possible that this shot contains every existing Halcyon. As far as I can tell, no museums have a Halcyon in their corridors, except possibly the Video Game History Museum in Frisco, Texas. If I ever end up in Texas for some reason, like, I don't know, my plane crashes, I'll head there and see if they've got it. So the Halcyon was a failure. It didn't sell very well, in fact it arguably didn't actually make it to the stores in a way people could buy, and the company went bankrupt pretty soon after. But that's not the end of Taya's quest. When the company started to go under, they started selling conversion kits for Dragon's Lair arcade cabinets. It's hard to tell how well those sold either, but Laserdiscs, marquees, instruction manuals and EEPROM chips from the game are floating around on eBay, so there's probably at least a few. I've heard tell of the arcade version appearing at conventions and some other gaming events, it's still pretty rare though, and the Laserdiscs alone cost hundreds, never mind if you'd be able to get together the technology to actually play them. Wait, what's this? Taya's Quest? On CD-ROM? From Canada? For only 19.94 Canadian US dollars? I mean, I had to. Didn't I? I had to. I needed to know. <sighs> and here we are. Is it in the shot? Okay, great, yeah. Decades and entire consoles later on a disc far smaller than it was ever designed for. This disc was printed in 2005, over 20 years after it was originally made. And that means it's another 12 years old on top of that. The latest system requirements that it recommends what operating system you can use is Windows XP. God, remember those days when that was the fastest operating system? This is... Just... God, it even smells of Windows XP. Like a very old new car smell and just the beginning of dust. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. It's like a time capsule. Thanks, Canada. Hey, according to this Digital Leisure put this out, uh, you might remember them as the people who did some PlayStation Home like casino games that were pretty popular, and then when PlayStation Home closed I think they're moving them to uh, Steam. And then before- oh wait! Before that they did the re-releases of uh, Dragon's Lair and the sequel to that and uh, Space Eggs, didn't they? So it makes sense that they would do this. Did they also do Mad Dog McCree and Space Pirates? Space Pirates is like a game only I seem to remember whenever I bring it up. I hope I'm not imagining that game. Anyway, let's close the loop on all this and actually give this game a look, shall we?
In a traditional fantasy land, the bad wizard man thing, Sorcerball, has killed almost all of the Elder Kings and is going to take over the world. The last in the Elder Kings line is the player character, Taya Alkenred. His wizard mentor, Druce, wants him to gather the five artifacts that form an amulet called the Hand, made by another wizard named Quod in order to beat Sorcerball. Quod is gone, but the one who will come remains. I am ready. But before Druce will send him on his quest, he gives him a final test. That rhymed, that was weird. There, choose and exit quickly, or fail this test of magic. You have to choose the left door or the right door. If you pick the right door, you have failed there. You're dead. You're just dead. Your mentor's test kills you immediately if you choose the wrong door. And he's supposed to be the good guy. Anyway, if you get it right, he gives you a pouch with your first three items, single-use spells which are the solution to three puzzles in the game, and then you get to go out into the world. I have tried 22 apprentices over the years, and they have all died. I bet right now Taya's thinking, yeah, and how many of those did you kill by sending to the ticking clock flying symbol fantasy zone? The game does diverge in gameplay from its predecessors in a kind of significant way. You actually choose places to go and what items to use, and take your time to make decisions. You're no longer hitting buttons to not die while traversing a linear path. It's incredibly simplistic though. A lot of choices amount to picking one and hoping it's not the one that kills you, like with the two doors, but it's a fairly significant difference. It's basically a really rudimentary point and click adventure, or perhaps to be a bit more accurate, a choose your own adventure book, like Warlock of Firetop Mountain, or Creature of Havoc, or the Goosebumps ones. You choose where to go from a list with a mouse in this version instead of saying a number out loud, sadly, and sometimes you use an item. It's very trial and error. For example, at this point, a lady gives you this advice. My son was your age when he learned that the coal fire, which burns on the marsh waste, can destroy the landwares. What's a landware? How is this advice useful to a player? It's a made-up word! <laughs> then at one point later on, these ghosts attack you, and then you get one chance to use an item, and you die if it's the wrong item. Ah! Well, guess what? These are the landwares! And you need to have gone to a place that's covered in fire, and click on it, to then realise it's cold fire, so that you take some, and then put it in your bag first, and then you use it here to kill the landwares and progress. And yeah, the game lets you use the scrolls in places where they don't solve the puzzle they're made for, and they're just gone. You can waste a scroll on the landwares if you think that's what you're supposed to use, and they even have it so they don't kill you for trying, even though you can't progress at this point, because you can no longer pick up this crystal without exploding, because you needed the scroll of release. The art and animation isn't nearly as good as in Dragon's Lair or Space Ace. It looks okay, but it was quite clearly rushed. The game keeps finding excuses to not have to lip-sync anyone's mouths. There, I remember when you were but a child. I can only give you this pouch. Choose where in the kingdom of Wygard you wish to begin. Friend, can you help me? I... Bruce sent you, didn't he? Dryads? Yes, and we know of your quest. Can destroy the landwares. Help! Go someplace else! Someplace far away! Are you the people of the dunes? I mean no harm to you. Mm, words deceive. Show us proof that you mean well. No way! Strangers are welcome! There are different voice lines for coming back to some areas more than once, which means the animation with no clear mouth movement can be easily reused. I think this is why they did it, but it just means the whole game looks less good at the expense of being reusable. What? You again? What? You again? <laughs> Overall, it's a lot less dynamic or fantastical than the other games, but since it relies more on decision-making than quick reflexes, I can understand the visual change. Some of the deaths are still pretty funny. This might just be the only game in history where you can be killed by wheat. Also, the voice acting's pretty good, isn't it? Apart from, after you kill the false king Torlok, remember that name, by the way, one of his guards has this to say. I'm sorry, I had no choice. For ten years I've waited to see this. Thank you, friend! 
Nothing says welcome to a realm of fantasy and adventure quite like Kermit the Frog. This version is basically just a bunch of video files playing in a custom video player. If you check the disc's files, even the inventory screens are just .mpegs on a loop. It's almost clever how they managed to get the old game to fit together on a new system, but it's also a reminder that the game you're playing is literally just a collection of interlocking menus, like the weird bonus games they used to put on early DVD releases of films. Anyway, after a bit over 30 minutes of trial and error, somewhat less than the months Dyer predicted, I had three artifacts and reached the bridge to the fourth kingdom, the Far Reaches. Pass and be warned that the southern barbarians roam the Far Reaches. It is a lawless kingdom now. W wait, what? You have beaten Taya's quest? More challenges await you in Shadowen? The sequel to Taya's what? The game ends with a trailer for a game called Kingdom Shadowen. Why does the main character look so different? How is there a sequel to a game no one played on a console that no one bought? How did playing this game only give me more questions? What? Okay. It turns out there's one more twist in the tale of Taya's Quest. There's also the twist that it's pronounced Thayer's Quest but it's too late to re-record all the voiceover, so. The game was either left unfinished or intended to be the first part in a series released hastily to try to recoup costs for it in the Halcyon, with plans to make a sequel before the company went bankrupt and the whole endeavor was scrapped. While this 2005 CD is a close to faithful version of the original audio and video of the arcade version, and also there's a DVD version released at the same time just for DVD players and there's some more behind the scenes footage on it, a decade prior, in 1995, 10 years before this version and 10 years after the original release, the game was ported to the 3DO, the CDI, and DOS PCs under the name Kingdom The Far Reaches. The CDI and 3DO are basically considered critical and commercial failures, but this is perhaps the one context where I can't make fun of them, because even they're a step up from the game's previous release on a console that never even officially came out. God, I feel kinda sorry for Rick Dyer. The poor guy kept trying and it kept just not quite working out. This version of the game is the one that got the sequel, Kingdom Shadowen, released a year later for the same consoles. Some versions of Kingdom Part 2 Shadowen are just called Shadowen for some reason. I also picked up a copy of Kingdom Book 1 The Far Reaches, just to see what changes they made apart from the title. Let's check that out real quick. You coming with me, boy? This version uses more compressed graphics, but also makes a bunch of weird changes. Along with the title, a bunch of character names have changed too. The Elder Kings are now the Argent Kings, Taya Alkenred is now Lathan Kandor, Drus is now Dalen, Quode is now Mobus, and Sorcibol is now Torlok. Torlock has become Drake's Blood the Wicked. Obviously this means the voice acting had to be redone by new actors. And by actors, I mean whoever Rick Dyer got to program this new version got into a vocal booth for like five minutes. Morbus is gone, but the one who will come remains. I am ready. <laughs> I can't verify the quote, but apparently Dyer thought the original names were 270s, so he changed them. I don't think the names were the problem with the original's release. It was probably everything else. I can almost see Dyer in my head trying his very best to step as far as possible away from the game's previous incarnation, given its frankly traumatic history. The opening sequence is now an optional cutscene triggered at the beginning, which ends before Druce, sorry, Dalen, makes you do the stupid bit with the doors. When you start the game, you get a piece of all new animation, which looks kind of bad, in which Te sorry, Lathan gets told by Dalen about Drake's blood seizing the throne and how you need three artifacts to stop him. This is an interesting change. The original game ended suddenly partway through, and this cutscene basically rewrites the entire plot to be about doing the thing you actually end up doing towards the end of the actual amount of game they made. Too much of the game's dialogue references the evil wizard at the beginning, and he still appears in the game to attack you, so they couldn't take him out entirely. It's so weird to have one opening talk about the evil wizard who's now called Torlok, and then the actual opening tells you your quest is to stop a different bad guy who isn't called Torlok anymore. Like everything else about the legacy of this game, it's weird and esoteric for seemingly no reason. Even the name is weird. The Far Reaches is one of the two kingdoms from the original you don't end up going to because the game ends on the bridge to visit them. Why is this version called Kingdom The Far Reaches when there's no Far Reaches in it and there's technically five kingdoms? That's a plural amount of kingdoms. Ugh. 
I, I wish I hadn't noticed this, it's just frustrating. The gameplay is a bit different too. You now click around a map screen to decide where to go. The first place you go is Dalen's Mansion, where the cutscene from going through the correct door in the original just sort of plays as if you just walked in and he gives you the scrolls. They also added more complex puzzles. For example, this guy who just talks to you in the first game is now blind and you get a scroll of seeing from Dalen to use to get his advice. Dalen also asks you which scrolls you want him to work on next, so you actually get to make a couple more choices than in the original and the use of a main map screen actually makes it feel like you're traveling a world. Kind of. Slightly. A little bit. My son was your age when he learned that the cold fire which burns on the marsh waste can destroy the mist monsters. They call the landwares the mist monsters in this version. It's like Daya actually got my memo. Now the puzzle is decipherable by humans. Once you save the princess, you get the second new cutscene that's clearly new animation, where the princess says thanks and invites you to stay. I accept your gracious offer, princess. Then together, they invent fireworks. Also, there's this really rocking track that plays when it's trying to load the credits. I think I want this as my new ringtone. And the credits roll and the game ends with the trailer for Shadowen. So now, after covering this new version of the game, we can actually talk about its sequel. Its animation style has been altered significantly and the character looks completely different. I have a feeling Dyer and Co. wanted to further differentiate Kingdom from Taya's Quest and did so by changing how everything looked when the time came to make new animation for this sequel. Or maybe he just had different animators at this point. At this point, they probably either moved on to bigger projects or quit and become a baker. Working as an animator is really hard at the best of times and working on Taya's Quest seemed like it was a nightmare. The sequel is basically just more of the sort of gameplay from the previous game. You get the other two relics, and finally, after over a decade of waiting, you get to kill Torlok. Yeah! Oh, come on, that was it? And then Lathan kisses the princess from the first game, and fireworks go off again, but there's more this time. And credits. Why did I make this? Well, maybe because it's an interesting story. An immensely popular game that went away so quickly that its successor was all but forgotten. A recklessly optimistic console in a period when home gaming was hemorrhaging money that never even made it out the door. And a relentless barrage of unpronounceable names. In June, this warehouse will come to life. The new home video system that Rick and Jan Dyer have banked everything on will be shipped from here. My wife and I, as you probably can guess, are gambling everything we own on this, so it's, it's kind of scary, but it, that's the sort of thing well, that makes it, you want to yeah, succeed. It, 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 it. Rick and his wife threw everything they had into Halcyon, and Halcyon took it all, took everything, and then it was gone, leaving them as barely a footnote in the history of video games. Maybe it's because I think Don Bluth is overrated, and I find his continued attempts to revive Dragon Slayer to be a little bit crass, and wanted to talk about the game's actual creator instead of the man who keeps getting the credit. If you type Rick Dyer into Wikipedia, you get a disambiguation page linking to two possible notable Rick Dyers. One of them is ours, the video game designer. His page is three short paragraphs in length. The second is titled Rick Dyer, and then in brackets, Bigfoot. Some guy who spread Bigfoot hoaxes is remembered in more detail than the inventor of Dragon's Lair. Or maybe it's because the way modern gaming's going right now, I'm a little bit worried. The marketplace is only getting bigger, and the tools of game creation are more available than ever before. And that means there's a lot more games competing for people's attention. There may not be another crash, but it's still a very big pool for a small fish. In any creative medium, it's scary to work knowing that what you create may only exist in permanent obscurity. The people who make it might be talented, but increasingly, they're also very lucky. Undertale got recognised because Toby Fox was in the right place at the right time with an already existing following around his Homestuck music. Dragon's Lair did well partially on the back of that name they put all over it. The next designer with the talent Toby Fox had might not be so lucky. The ancient Romans used to tell the story of a man called Romulus, a fantastical figure descended from royalty, raised by wolves who took part in all the most important foundational events in Roman history, and named Rome after himself. 
The Romans looked at their society and liked to imagine that it had all been the plan of some great genius. The Romans believed in dozens of mythical engines of creation. What was one more? Hundreds of incredible works of art have been done of epic historical events, huge important moments in history, the actions of gods or supposed men like Romulus. One of my favourite paintings is The Lace Maker. Johann Vermeer painted a loving, accurate and detailed rendition of a girl making lace. Vermeer celebrated real people doing ordinary things. He offered the radical idea that you didn't have to be special or important or magical or legendary to be worth being painted or thought about or remembered. So it turns out there are two ways of explaining history. We can be like Geoffrey of Monmouth or the early Romans and invent these magical, wondrous, brilliant people who gave everything to us. A wizard made Stonehenge all by himself. A man called Romulus invented Rome out of whole cloth and took part in every major historical event required to fulfil his amazing design. Don Bluth made Dragon's Lair. Or we can be like Vermeer. A bunch of ordinary, everyday people built Stonehenge just by working together and putting time and effort into it. A bunch of ordinary people make video games by working together very hard for hours and hours and hours and days and years to make it. A bunch of regular, ordinary people built Rome over the span of a very long time, contributing to what would later be remembered as the exploits of one man. This way is nowhere near as magical as the ones we like to imagine put our world together. The truth is often very mundane, but maybe that's okay. We're pioneers, we're doing something that's never been done. We have artists, we have writers, we have engineers, we have technicians, they're all working together and that has never existed before. There's never really been a reason for those three groups to all coexist simultaneously. They, they, what we're really doing is combining art with science. I think there's something sad but beautiful about Rick Dyer and his dreams of Halcyon. He calls himself and his team pioneers in this news broadcast. And the truth is, he's right. Pioneer isn't an inherently positive term. It just means you were among the first to explore something, and that doesn't mean you were successful or right. A lot of early pioneers didn't make it back. And a lot of people, a lot of us, are going to end up more like Rick Dyer than we'd hoped to be. So if we can't learn to love and remember people like Rick, we're condemning ourselves in turn to be forgotten. Your work might not reach the audience it deserved, or you might not make something anyone likes. And it can be soul-crushing to embark on a journey knowing you might not succeed. But if we can learn to accept that it's okay to try and fail, that people who fail are worth being remembered and appreciated, then maybe we can all at least learn to enjoy the humanizing experience of failure together. Thank you for watching. This video was quite a lot of time in the making, and I can only do things like this with the support I receive through Patreon, so I'd like to thank my supporters very much. In addition to the names scrolling past the screen right now, I'd especially like to thank... James Adair Nathan and Bronwyn XX underscore Antfucker 69 underscore 420XX and you have to pronounce the four X's Jan Anders Bremer Parker Anderson Jenny Angel Sheena Artrip Brennan Arts Cal Ashton, Heba Assad, Amy B, Jordan Barrett, Sam Bayliss, Max Barbecue King, Findlay Bowick Copley, Grafen Blackpaw, Big Boy, Jakutcha Boris, A Bowl of Creamy Tomato Soup, Eric Bronner, Chip Bush, H Bomber Guy But With Breaded Mac and Cheese Hands, H Bomber Guy But With Yowie Hands, <laughs> Eugene Butler and Samuel Butler, I hope they're related, that'd be cool, Kurt C. Yost, John Cantwell, Zachary Clark, Stephen Cohn, Philip Coffey, Krista Collin, Justin Conkerbeard, David Craggs, I'm Daddy's Little Bitch, seriously though, I'm trapped inside of a Cormac Delaney, Hjort Dog, I don't know, like a butt or something, Jason Durso, an egg painted to look like a man, Avi Finkel, a fish named Nabby, Kit Foley, The Frankfurt Shawl, Corin Gardina, Andrew Gilly, the Godforsaken Strongest Rat Alive, Aiton Goldstrom, Zoe Gowin, 
Rachel Gray, Scott Gerton, Willow H, Michael H. Prey, Mark Harmon, Rebecca Harold, Jack Harvey, Nathan Hoare, I H Bomberguy am deeply in love with Jim Sterling and want to kiss him. World Heavyweight Champion Patrick the Breezy P Finnegan, Rickard Hevosmar, Tyler Howard, Eric Hunter, James Id, Eden Yankovic Suma, Ace Jenny, Besotten Jenny, General Ginger of the Oz All Girl Revolutionary Army, Qui Gon Jinn, Good Night Sweet Prince, Ben Kaplan, Dave Kemp, Sean Kemp, Adrian Kingsley Hughes, Thomas Kistner. Florian Knox, Lucas Koken, Rene Larshaug, Paul Laswell, Alex Lemkovich, Gracie Lipscomb, Kelly Mariella Kay, Benedict Marco, Gary Marshall, Tom Martell, Christopher McDonald, Spunker McGraw, Jacqueline Merritt, Katie Mersex is a cutie, John McNone, Garrett Mitchell, Three Fifths of a Brain, Hero of Time 88, Alicia Parker Martell, Justin Partridge, Richard Pearson, S. Peter Davis, John Pettersson, Robert Phillips, Siegfried, Slayer of the Immortal Dragon, K. Played Dota, Alistair, Please Play Life is Strange, Silas Pumpkins, Alexander R. Corbett, Totally Radical Politics, Several Rats Participating in an Elaborate and Daring Casino Heist, Davis Remy, Evan Ritchie, Lissy Roberts, David Rose, Vandella Ridbeck, Anna S., Super Saiyan Rose Kami Kensei, Elijah Scanlon, Marco Shard, Justin Schwenderman, Andrew Scheimer, Naoto Shirogane, Mons Silverplatz Toonstrom, George Soros, The Spectre of Communism, Mike Stanley, Niltiak Stealer of Souls, Ash Stryker, Daniel Sullivan, Lord Sir Mr. Supercalinialistic Expialidocious of House Hanmore, <laughs> Luke Swanson, Al Swigert, Adult Sword Owner, Coach Tegina Carlos Mad Dog 6 Strats RP Walk 2 Chains Cabito, David the Benevolent Malevolence, Gar the Internet Dog, Maria the Maiden of Blue Fire, Jeffrey Theobald, I think Brandon is an awesome guy and I want to be his friend, Kevin Thurber, Pio Gadig, Tigrin Avetisian, Jordan Tullis, It turns out I was wrong about everything, Handsome Unlimited, Tapio Unto Oscari Taronan, Ryan Van Shark, Riley Van Dyke, Daniel Vincent Chilton, Heretic Void, Grick Von Gool, Christopher Wade, Jason Walter, Thad Wazalewski, Pete West, Catherine Wilde, Ryan William Cox, Lewis Woodrow, Don't Worry Buddy, Don't Worry Buddy, Don't Worry Buddy, Don't Worry Buddy, Seamus Usarian, Recovering Zombie, Aceylon, Amontadillo, Kieran, Claw Sue, Kabiza, Commissar Taco, Dash of Week, Devon's Hands Melt, Femininja, Geekyapa, Get Dunked On, Gnostic Dude, Hey It's Grace, Hero of War, James, Jeremy, Jerry Terry, Joe, Calfsile, Catherine, Lauren, MacArthur, Minty Freakin' Fresh, Momi, Mr. Clonum, Niflet, Procor, Rue, Samael, Shadowbag, Sigma Vega Sigma, Syntharana, Sol, Soy, Swamp Selkie, Silian, Ure, Whackman, Wagabal Smurf, Weebka, XXX underscore Swagmaster420 underscore XXX, and Zodak. And now it's time for a new segment I'm putting at the end of this video called What things did I get wrong in the first draft of this video that my patrons who get an early version of the video pointed out uh, and reminded me to change? Firstly, I'd like to say a big thanks to Kenny Green, who pointed out that uh, I somehow managed to misspell Goosebumps book cover as Ghostbusters book cover in the credits. And an extra special thanks to Garrett Lathy, who pointed out that I forgot to put his name in the credits. Thank you for pointing that out, and I'm so sorry.